at the end of every day, I would go home and in the notes app on my phone, I'd write down everything that I thought I messed up. And you did this weird thing with your eyes, like why couldn't you say that word properly? Like why did your voice keep cracking? And just rip myself to shreds. Hi, I'm Gracie Mercedes, and welcome back to Not Blank Enough, a podcast about everyday insecurities and triumphs. In this episode, I'm talking with Oliver Stark, the British actor currently on Fox's 911, talks about imposter syndrome, white privilege, body image, and what it was like working with an acting pro like Angela Bassett as a relatively new actor. I hope you enjoy this intimate conversation we titled, Not Talented Enough. Hi, Oliver Stark. Hi. How How are are you you? doing? I'm doing really, really... (laughs) I was going to say really, really good, and then I was going to transform that into really, really okay. Yeah. I don't know how good any of us can truly feel at this moment, but um, I'm doing okay. That makes complete sense. Um, mm-hmm. Well, welcome to Not Blank Enough. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for having me. Um, so I usually tell people how I know you first, and I met you because I got to do a day on 911. Mm-hmm. I got to play a pregnant woman, and mm-hmm. you and Peter Krause delivered my baby. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we did. He he did most of the delivering. I think I was just there for the catch. Exactly, exactly. For the important part, as it's also known. Yes, yes. And so um, you guys were so lovely. I think we've had this discussion before, but I had mentioned that whenever you're a day player on a TV show, most of the time, you know, the, the lead actors, they're nice to you, they're cordial, but then they kind of ignore you <laughs> and mm-hmm. go about their mm-hmm. day, which I totally understand because they have to see and deal with so many uh, you right. know, day players and extras and sure. everything else. Right. But you and Peter were so nice and went out of your way to make me and the other girls who were there for the day mm-hmm. feel super welcome and cool. Do you guys do that with everyone? No, absolutely not. Uh, no, oh, no, no, no. Okay. Yeah, we do. We do. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's something that I think is a really uh, intense show to shoot. And the, and it, it oftentimes feels almost out of control. And it's it's... No, it's controlled chaos, but but there is some element of chaos. And I think the only thing that at certain times kind of keeps it on the track is the people and, and, and having good relationships between each other and, you know, whoever comes onto the show, whether that's crew or, or guest actors or actresses, you know, um, I think everybody has to kind of feel like they're there and know what they're doing in a sense of not they need to bring their A game. It's lovely when they do, but but just in the sense of like understanding that we're all in this together, and I know it feels crazy, and like that was a particularly crazy night. Yeah. You know, for anybody that doesn't know, it was a scene where I think what was it, three women were going into labor in a yoga class, and it was yeah. a, it was a full moon dictated yoga, and um, so yeah, there was so much going on. I can't remember. I think it was season one, episode. Six. Mm -hmm. I want to say I believe so yeah and um it was a really fun episode and it was an overnight shoot and it was definitely crazy and it was it was but it was so much fun and 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 that kind of um philosophy of of of, you know engaging with everyone and really wanting to be in that moment with them both in the scene and and out of the scene I think comes from the top down from Pete from Angela from Kenny Choi from Aisha it's like me coming into a show and seeing that that is how they conduct themselves it's a really lovely thing to get to kind of see in person every single day and, and, and kind of take inspiration from that and be like, wow, okay, I want to say hi to everybody. I want to introduce myself to everybody and in times gone by, shake everybody's hand. Probably yeah. not going to be doing that anymore. But, right. you know, I, I want to, you know, offer myself and, and, and make those people feel as comfortable as possible because that's when people do their best work as well, you know, when, when they feel comfortable. So it's in everybody's interest professionally and personally oh that's such a good point because there's definitely been sets where i've been kind of intimidated by the lead actors or the the series regulars and then it's like you get in your head and that absolutely doesn't help your performance of course let's go back to the very beginning of oliver stark now i think it's funny that you play an american on the show and so i feel like i know personally i had like reposted something you posted once and i got so many messages from people being like he's british like they had no idea that you mm. were not from the states that's good which is good it's great we'll that, that means you, yeah, you yeah, have yeah, a good yeah. american accent which a british accent is so hard for me personally so i can't even imagine how you do it the other way around mm-hmm. but let me know, uh, like tell me a little bit about your beginnings and, and where you come from and and how you ended up in the states so i born and raised in london 
Um, I didn't necessarily grow up wanting to be an actor. Um, I was much more interested in playing football or soccer, I believe, <laughs> I should say. And and just, I mean, I, I was kind of actually one of these people, as I was growing up, my, my dream career was constantly changing. I wanted to own a construction company. I wanted to be a football player. I wanted to be a chef. I wanted to own hotels. Like that, it was just like week by week, it was or month by month, it was, it was just changing from kind of one industry to a completely different one with no real discernible link between them. <laughs> but I always was performing in some sense, right? Like even if it was plays at school or if it was just kind of liking to be the, the louder one and the, the center of attention when I was growing up. Um, I, have, I have one brother who's a little older than me, but certainly in my experience was a lot more reserved. Mm. And I was the kind of like, I'm the younger brother and I'm here. You kind need of to be more wild. Exactly <laughs> that. So, um, so I think I was kind of used to being on a stage, whether, as I say, it be at school or just in my own little head. And then it wasn't until I was about 18 and I was meant to be going off to university that I first started considering, hey, I've always really enjoyed acting. Um, I, I, I don't think I knew at the time what it was about acting that I enjoyed. I just knew that I liked the feeling of it. Um, I liked being a part of it. I liked just just that world around me. And again, I'm only doing it at school. Mm. But I knew that there was something in it that was really enjoyable. So I started to think about it as a career for the first time. How old were you then? Around 18? About 18, yeah. yeah. Um, so I was, I mean, I've been applying to go to university to study economics. Oh, wow. And then I was like, mm, I don't want to do that. <laughs> so I didn't take any of my places. and But I still didn't have like a real plan. I didn't know how you go about becoming an actor. I right. just know that it's a difficult thing to do, but I, I have no real entry point. Is it as hard to do in London as it is like here in the state? Yeah, I mean, obviously it's a s smaller circle, smaller mm -hmm. industry. But the thing that I have actually found is the real difference and why I actually think I was able to find more success in America than I was back home is that because there's less money in the UK because it's a smaller industry, I find that they take less risks. Mm. So whereas what I found when I came over here was there's a real element of like, we want to discover somebody. Like, and and I, I guess in some sense that goes back to like the American dream, like you can be anyone and then we can put you up here and we're a part of like your discovery. Right. Whereas in the UK, it's kind of like, we have these six people that we like, we're going to use them over, over and over, over. again. Mm -hmm. So it felt like could get these little bit, you know, few lines in this, few lines in that, but I never felt any potential for like, hey, we're going to offer you like, this is substantial. Like until I came to America, I don't think I'd ever audition for a part that was more than a few lines. And suddenly you come out here, especially as a British actor, mm -hmm. because of um, immigration reasons, you can only really read for leads and things. No way. So because if you come out here without a visa, uh -huh. whatever network it is, they're not going to sponsor me Just to get a visa for two lines, right? They're going to hire an American oh actor. Oh my God, that is so interesting. So you kind of wrangle your way into or immediately reading for these bigger parts so I was suddenly getting these scripts and it was like what, wait this is the scene like there's real meat in this right and so it, it kind of yeah it's almost like you you jump this hurdle I gotta stop you for a second because, yes, like, <laughs> because you're I horrified feel, I'm horrified no I feel like I've just like taken the curtain off of Oz right now because I think as an American actor and I've had this conversation with other American actors um there's such a I don't know what the word is, but there's such a thing about British actors coming here and like immediately being successful and like how the hell does it happen all the mm -hmm. time? And you guys are better actors and you have the accent and people go crazy over the accent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's funny to know that logistically, that's also yeah. why it's happening because as an American actor, you can go years, decades mm -hmm. just auditioning for guest stars and, and co-stars, a yeah. few lines here, a few lines there, and never even get the opportunity to audition for something yeah, yeah. as a lead or, as a lead of a, a TV show. So that's one side of it. And then the other side is, so I'm coming over to America and I have my British agent, right? Mm. And so I've been doing the guest things and, and, and that in the UK. And then I come over here and my British agent is getting on the phone to American managers and American agents and being like, I got this kid, he's coming out. You want to meet him. Right. There's somebody that when you enter into the American industry, there's already somebody like fighting your corner. Mm -hmm. And talking you up. Exactly and that. how so, great so, you are, yeah. And, and going back to that discovery thing, you you want to be a part of this like you you need to meet this guy that's amazing so so there's that side of it and then yeah also from an immigration standpoint nobody's gonna give me any immigration papers to come and read one line so it's yeah so you get 
a chance to read for these bigger parts. Um, wow. So, so I think, I think I'm, I'm happy to have opened up that world, the, the cheat codes that we've all been, we've been given there. Oh my God. That's so interesting. Especially because I, I study at, um, identity. Do you know identity mm-hmm. from yeah, LA? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Cause yeah. I, I came mean, out I know of London. identity from when it was like tiny little thing in, uh, yeah, in yeah, London. Yeah. And, and now I have it's a lot of friends that came thing. through there. Yeah. yeah. So they came out to Los Angeles about two years ago and it's a acting school or conservatory out of London. I met a great group of really talented actors there. And their whole thing is trying to give people of color more opportunities. Mm -hmm. And so they're doing that here as well. But yeah, we have had these conversations about the British actor versus the American actor Mm -hmm. and and how here in America there is such a, oh my God, all I can think of is the word hard on, which is not very appropriate. (laughs) But yeah. I was, I was going to go with like, there's like this mythology around us where it's like, they're all classically trained. They yes. Like all grew up in a the theater. Like yes. they all, and it, and it, it's not true. But also, by the way, me, the fact that I said hard on and you said <laughs> mythology is a perfect Oh yeah, maybe there example. is something to it. Maybe there, <laughs> <laughs> it's a perfect example oh, of the yeah. American versus the British. Okay. <laughs> no, not at all. Going towards the theme of not enoughness during mm. this um, upbringing in London and this pursuit of all these different career ideas and then finally settling on being an actor. Mm. Were there ever times where you had any feelings of not enoughness and what was that? Yeah. So, so, (laughs) you know, it's funny because looking at the name of the show and some of the themes you've had, I was like, I kind of had this, this one thing that kind of really stuck out to me. Right. But then I also feel like I'm killing the rest of your episodes forever. Mm -mm. And this idea of like, not anything enough. <laughs> oh. And what, what, what I mean by that is that, like, and it's 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 a, it's a nice thing in some sense. So I, I don't want to sound ungrateful when I say this, but I was one of these people that when I was growing up, there was a, always a like, whatever you do, you're going to be great. Mm. Like, oh, what, whatever industry, whatever job you you decide to do, you're going to be good. Like, mm-hmm. and I think because of that, this odd pressure that comes with that, I, I I never specialized in anything. I never went, oh this is my thing. I'm going to do it. I kind of went, apparently I'm just going to be all right. So I, I, I didn't become the great athlete. I didn't become the amazing singer. I didn't become like, I, I didn't have this path that I was like, I'm going to master this. And it's kind of that jack of all trades, master of none thing, which is what I felt like for a long time. And then actually I started looking back and going, well, maybe there are people who are across the board less capable, but they went, this is my thing. And they became experts in it. And they became masters of it. And suddenly they are the people that I aspire to be like. Mm. I think that was it for me, like just not knowing where my place was. And again, like a similar kind of thing of like getting on with so many different groups of people. So then never really finding my own identity. Like I would hang out with, and to use American terms here, like the jocks. And then the, the what I like, I would, I would float between all these kind of peer groups and, and do quite well in all of them. But then because of that, I was always on the periphery of all of them because I was never like yeah. in there with anybody. I was never like, this is who I am. Like, these are my people. And so I think I just drifted. Yeah, that's really interesting. So I will say, Oliver, you are the first white male, <laughs> straight white male, actually, that I've interviewed on this show. So in terms of the show, you know, because we do think a lot of times of – this not fitting in, not feeling enough, coming from external, you know, opinions and people of color, LGBTQ people, women having those ec- extra hurdles to go over and those extra mm-hmm. um, fights that they have to do all the time, right? And so sometimes maybe that forces us to to try to be the best we can be. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like what they say, like, okay, if you're a black man, you have to work five times as hard to, to get Absolutely. as much money yeah, as, yeah. you know, X, Y, or Z. So it's interesting that maybe as a straight white man that you would think, like you were saying, you get this outside thing like, oh, I could do anything. There's nothing really saying I can't do anything. There's mm-hmm. no one telling me I can't do X, Y, or Z. So then having this thing, well, maybe I'll just try this or try this and try mm-hmm. and doing exactly that and not becoming a quote unquote pro or, or 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 being a super expert on one thing because you, you almost feel like, oh, well, I can kind of do anything I want to do. Yeah. And, and I'm very cautious here not to be like, oh, woe is me. Like, right, oh, right. That everything's <laughs> been so easy. Like, right. obviously, there's a, as a straight white male, there's a whole load of privilege that comes with that where, right. where now I can sit back and be like, oh, yeah, it's been so hard. Like, come on, like, I, I know exactly 
how lucky I've been and, and the doors that have opened for me that wouldn't necessarily open for other people. So, mm-hmm. so you know, I have to be extremely conscious of that and, and acknowledge that and be aware of it, I think, at all times, because otherwise you, you, you lose sight of that, right? And then how do you help anybody else? But it's, it's funny, right? Because I feel like a lot of people that look like me cling on to struggle. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that part of that reason is because they feel like struggle is so much a part of people's identity. Right. And, and community, in my opinion, British white people, like, there's no real culture there. Do you know what I mean? Like, there's, so there's no real community because I think that community comes out of shared culture and, and shared values. And, and it's not something I really associate with white British people or white American people, maybe. So I think that a lot of them, that's why then we move into like the world of cultural appropriation where mm-hmm. because people try and like take these things from these other cultures because they, they want to feel a part of it. Yeah. And, and actually, you just kind of have to appreciate it from for what it is and, 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 and not try and take ownership of that, you know? Yeah, or there's like that new... I feel like the meme that's going around or the, I think they're making shirts now that just say, you know, you can't love black culture and not love black people because there are Mm -hmm. so many people who want to love the culture, but then Mm -hmm. not love or have respect for the people. And speaking of white privilege, it's so interesting because it is, you know, a word that is a very hot word. It gets people very emotional. and, and, And I think what you said is exactly right. I think the idea of white privilege doesn't mean that just because you are white, you do not struggle. Of course, there are white people who struggle. Yeah. There are poor whites. There are, uh, you know, p- white people who have all sorts of problems just because you're white doesn't mean you don't have problems. It just means your problems are not caused by what you look like. Exactly. That. Or who you love or what your sex is. So, yeah, I think that's a really great thing to acknowledge. It's like just because you're a straight white man doesn't mean your life will be perfect. No, but it, w- it won't not be perfect because of the color of your skin. Right. But you can acknowledge yes. that um, that that you may have some privileges that other people don't. Yeah. No. And, and it's, I tell you, it's, it's something that I, over the past few years, have found myself getting into Twitter arguments with, right, with, <laughs> with, with so many times where, because, you know, I, I feel like it's quite important to be loud about that fact. And, and that's been, actually been the hardest thing for me is, has been finding this balance of, speaking my mind on it and, and trying to educate my white friends or, or white followers. So being loud in one sense, but also then not speaking over black voices and, mm-hmm. and, and just so just trying to amplify them where I can. But then also if it's needed or if it's helpful, lending my voice to it. But but yeah, like the amount of people that when I talk about white privilege, they say it exactly that. And it's like, oh, you have no idea what I've been through. And it's like, no, I'm not saying that you've not yeah. been through anything that's hard. Like I'm sure you have. Now, everybody's been through something, but what I'm saying is that the reason is not the color of your skin. And, right. You know, and unfortunately, there are certain people, I think, that just don't have any real interest in hearing it. Mm-hmm. They may want to engage in that conversation on Twitter in that moment, but they're not really look, looking to have their mind changed. They're not really looking to, to have any effect, you know, uh, from, from that exchange. So um, eventually just kind of feel like you're shouting into the void, but... I think I think it's an important thing to try and do because, you know, then there have been times when someone's gone, oh, you kind of help me understand that now. Mm. And I suppose for every, it's like being an actor, right? For every 500 rejections, right. if, if you can help one person understand maybe a little bit more of the world and the society that they're living in, then maybe that balances out and it's worth it. I think it's worth it for sure. I think it's worth it. Yeah. And, and you know, yeah, I feel like it's almost a responsibility or a duty to take on that stress of having to have those arguments because obviously there's been so much going on in the in the world recently and I uh, saw this thing of like allyship fatigue and it's like come on now <laughs> you posted a few things and and then you're like oh, I just I just need to take a break and, and, and post something else uh, and it's like that that in itself is privilege right, right? The, the, like, to be able to be like okay but now I just want to po- post my marketing exactly time. exactly because it's not your life and and so to kind of be aware of that and to continue to speak up and have those arguments on behalf of other people when they feel tired because they are quite rightly allowed to feel tired mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so you're saying feeling of not anything enough mm. um, how does that relate to today and like your acting so now you're on this giant show Fox is 911, super mm. successful. You're one of the lead actors. You're fantastic on it. Do you still feel these? Do you not at least feel that you're a good actor or like enough of a good actor? Look at that face. I wish people could see this face right now. <laughs> uh, 
um, you know, I have my days where I'm like, I did good work today. Like, mm-hmm. I like that. Mm-hmm. And then I have my days where <laughs> I don't. Um, it's something I've got better at. You know, we're moving into our, whenever we are allowed to go back to filming, uh, into our fourth season. So we've done 46 episodes now, which, you know, is a big chunk of a TV show. Like for me, that's season one was cool. We did 10 episodes and then season two, we did 18 and three, 18. But after that first season, it was like, if, if this show went away now and got canceled, it would just be another thing that existed for a moment and then wasn't. I feel like now 46 episodes, like that was a thing that was there. Like mm-hmm. that was a TV show. Yeah. So I've, I've had time to kind of grow with it. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, when we started the show, I'd been a regular once before on a show on AMC called Into the Badlands. We did six episodes in that first season, so super short. And then before we started the second season, I found out I was going to die halfway through it. So, <laughs> so that was very short-lived. All right. So I felt very green still coming into 911. So there was that feeling to begin with. And then when I started seeing the other people that had been cast, and it's your Angela, Angela Bassett Dazzle. and your Pete Krauser and your Connie yeah. Britton and the the kind of gap between myself and them just felt so huge in in terms of experience I was super intimidated to begin with I didn't even think about that like I didn't even stop to think you end up on a show with Angela Bassett Peter Mm -hmm. Krause and Connie Britton and I'm I'm the only new one you know and then aside from that you've got Aisha Hines who's done a million jobs you've got Kenny Choi who one day I hope to watch some TV and not see him in something. He's right. in so much. Like <laughs> these people are so good at what they do. Mm-hmm. And then there's me and I'm just new. Brand new. To their credit, they never made me feel that way. Oh, like that's, that's nice. I remember the first day I shot with Angela. I can't remember what movie she'd watched. Some tiny independent movie. I think from, uh, I think it was a foreign movie. I don't even think it was American. And she had watched it that morning before work. And she like, started telling me the plot of it. And when I tell you, she was like acting out these moments for me. And I'm just sitting there like, this is Angela Bassett. (laughs) And she's like going through this. And then I think at one point they called us a set and she was like, one second. And like, so she could finish her story to me. And I was just like, yeah, one second, hold on, please. And, but it's like, there was no sense of I am who I am and you are who you are. It's like, I just felt like these were my colleagues and and pretty quickly, these were my friends. Mm -hmm. But I still had in the back of my mind and actually oftentimes in the front of my mind that fear of they not, know what they're doing and I don't. Yeah, like not – I don't want to say not talented enough, but – No, 100% not ta- – and, 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 you know, they've made a mistake. They're going to realize – Right. They, they've cast me because I, for some reason, had a really great audition, but I've, I've tricked them and they're about to realize <laughs> uh, that actually I can't do this thing. And okay. I think that is something we all deal with. It's like imposter syndrome, yeah, right? Yeah, let's let's unpack that a little bit because I feel like, well, I totally get the not not anything enough, and that's completely valid. I feel like this feeling of not talented enough mm. is so universal beyond mm-hmm. acting, but when you're an actor, it's on a daily kind of basis. And I bet, I mean, maybe not Angela Bassett because she's just like the queen of everything. I don't know, but I bet there are other people on your show who also felt that felt that way. And maybe every day feel that way to some extent. I've, I've made really good friends on the show. And um, I've asked a couple of them, like in particular, like Pete and Kenny are, are probably my two best friends in LA. Um, and it, just before this, I was on FaceTime to Aisha. Like I've built really good bonds there. Yeah. And like, I, I, I went to Kenny, I think this is probably in the first season. And I said to him, I, I'm just not here. I just don't feel like I'm hitting it at the moment. Like, do you ever feel like that? And he just looked at me and went, no. <laughs> but he went, but when I was 26, I did. And that was in the first season I was 26. He was like, felt yeah. like that all the time. He's like, mm-hmm. so of course you do. There was another time when I went, I think this was actually your episode. It wasn't your scene. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I think in, in the episode that you were in, I, I pulled a tape poem out of a guy's. Oh, God. Um, yeah, okay. Yes. Yeah, it was that yeah I remember that. Um, so that was a night shoot. And, I, and I, in the first season, I, I had like a really good run of like, I was a main character in this thing. And then, so that was episode seven. And then I think that night we got the script for episode eight. And I was barely in it. Oh, no. And I went to Pete and I was like, yeah, if I messed this up, like... Spiraling. Did you ever feel like like they don't put you in an episode a lot and it's because you've messed something up? And he, and he just looked at me and he kind of said, listen, I get it. 26, right? You go out on that field and you're like, throw me the ball. Let me show you what I can do. He was like, I'm 52. Sometimes it's nice to sit on the bench. 
<laughs> and I was like, oh, right. Okay. Yeah. It's not personal. It's just that story has just drifted. We're going over here for an episode. Right. It's not because I've messed it up and then it will come back to me. It's not personal. It's not, God, we need less of Oliver on the screen. It's, we're just telling the story. So, so that was a real adjustment. Oh, that's such a great example because I do think with age or with experience, you get that confidence that you're talking mm-hmm. about that Kenny and Pete have where it's mm-hmm. like, I got this. I've done this. I, 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 I know what's up. Mm-hmm. But when you're a newer actor or when you're newer at any kind of job, especially a creative job, I feel like there's constantly that feeling of imposter syndrome. There's constantly that feeling mm-hmm. of I don't belong here. They're going to find out I suck. I recently had that when I just wrote on Perfect Harmony for that was my first writing job. And I was in this writer's room and I felt like this imposter actor who's trying to be a writer. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and, like, and I was like, everyone hates me. Everyone thinks I'm terrible. I'm sure if I wrote on three, four, five more TV shows, I, I would eventually get to the point where I feel like, oh, I know I belong here. Yeah. Even through that season where I felt like there were definitely times where I had quote unquote good days and I loved the way my episode came out. I still constantly was like questioning myself and not Mm -hmm. feeling talented enough and not feeling funny enough. So yeah, it makes sense. But I love that insight from two people who have been doing this for a a longer time. Absolutely. I think, I think just over time, I think you, you learn your own worth and, and you realize, and it's something that I'm starting to tap into. And in the third season, I really found it a lot more than the previous two of like knowing what I bring to the table, feeling valid in my opinions and my thoughts and I did this thing during the second season where it sounds horrible especially to a creative person it sounds like the worst thing you could do to yourself but it really helped me so we were in quite a unique position where we were shooting and a week and a half later that sh- the, the episode was airing like it was super tight mm. and I was going through this really negative patch mentally with regards to this stuff with thinking I'm just I'm not doing a good job here so at the end of every day, I would go home and in the notes app on my phone, I'd write down everything that I thought I messed up. Oh, no. <laughs> like I would tear myself to pieces. Like why did I, you did this weird thing with your eyes? Like why couldn't oh, you say no. that word properly? Like why did your voice keep cracking? And just rip myself to shreds. Interesting thing to do to yourself. Uh, horrible. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. because a week later I could watch that on TV. And actually this is a show where I don't mind watching myself. So I watch it and I'd be like, it's fine. <laughs> it's it quite fine. good, actually. Yeah. So then I would go to that notes app and I tick it off, like, not concerned. So the next time that I go home and I'm like, my voice was doing that thing again. I go, no, wait, because I thought that was happening in season two, episode six. And then when I watched it on TV, it was totally fine. Yeah. I had this immediate feedback on myself where I could be like, it's in your head. It's not, and nobody else is watching you the way you are watching you. Right. You're your own worst critic. Absolutely. And, and, as much as we don't maybe always want to admit this about ourselves, when I watch the TV and I'm on it, I don't care who else is in the scene. I'm, I'm probably not watching them, right? Because <laughs> right, you're right. just, you're watching yourself and you're like, oh, shit, why did I do that? But nobody else is watching you that hard. Everybody exactly. else is watching the whole thing. Yeah, I was able to, to look at these insecurities that I was creating for myself and then look at the end product so quickly afterwards and be like, no, nah, you're making that up. That wasn't a real thing. It was a risk for sure. Um, but yeah. going forward, it, it kind of helped But you me. know what? We all do that. Like the only difference is that you actually take the time to write it down. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but we all constantly, I think in our heads, are judging. We're, we're our own worst critic. We're always thinking that we are way worse than we are. I've definitely done that too. Same thing with like, I feel like it happens a lot with self-tapes because I hate self-tapes. I hate mm-hmm. having to put something on 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 tape at home and not going into an an actual casting office Mm -hmm. and thinking, this is shit. This is shit. I can't get this. And then at a certain point, I just give up. I'm like, okay, I've been at this for 30 minutes or 45 minutes. I'm not doing anymore. And then I watch it back. I'm like, oh, oh, that take works. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's like during it, you're just constantly telling yourself how bad you are. Why can't I do this? Why why can I not get this? The thing with self-taping for me is, like I've I've gone through phases of self-taping where it's like, Three takes, that's it. If you can't do it in three, you can't do it. Yeah, that's smart. That was a nice, fun, quick way to live for a minute before I was like, no, 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 I need more takes. <laughs> but then I, you, then you get this fear of when I've had to do eight, nine, ten takes or whatever, right? And then I've got one that I'm happy with. It's the tenth one. I watch it back and I'm like, that was good. I'm like, but then next time I do go into a casting office, no one's giving me ten takes. No. Like, <laughs> I can't need ten takes for it to become good. So 
are they getting my take two? And then I go watch take two. Take two was awful. Mm. <laughs> and mm-hmm. I was at this fear of like, wow, maybe I do need to self tape because then I can control it. Yeah. Now and, I, and it's like, you, again, it's just another way to get in your own head. I, I think anytime you analyze yourself too intently or, or you know, it, it's something that I found with social media as well. Anytime you read too much about yourself, you just get in your own head. And it's like, I can't remember who I read said this, but they were like, people reviewing you or critiquing your work, it's none of your business. Mm, like just that. just do your thing, right? If yeah. they like it, it doesn't matter to you. You just have to find what feels good and what feels truthful. And a good friend of mine, a guy called Nicholas Pinnock, he is the lead now on an ABC show called For Life. He's doing really great work on that. Oh, yeah. He's like a bit of a mentor of mine from back home. Oh, he's British too. Yes, he is. Yes, sir. sorry about that. <laughs> Damn Brits. <laughs> I know, tell me about it. Um, he, this is, I think back in 2012, I did this monologue competition where it's this really cool thing. It's actually over here now. It's called Monologue Slam. Mm-hmm. And it's not like um, like a stuffy monologue event where everybody gets up, does their monologue and then sits back down. <laughs> it's like... It's got cool music. This guy called Jimmy Akimbola hosts it. He's like full of life, full of energy. He's a really fantastic actor himself. And he he does this thing just to give back and just to give actors a chance, right? So it's completely free. That's awesome. Yeah, I have a couple of friends who did it this year. Oh, cool. And yeah, so they get really great judges, um, like real people from the industry, real casting directors, real agents. Anyway, so I did it in 2012. Did not win. It's fine. It was fixed. (laughs) <laughs> um, no, but basically, so Nicholas came up to me afterwards and he was like, I just want to say that uh, you, you should have won that. I thought you were great. Oh. And, and so we stayed in contact and he's become a, a friend of mine. And anyway, I remember him once saying to me, so he never, never watches himself, never watches his own work. Like you can watch interviews of him and they'll ask him a question. He'll be like, I, I don't know. You, you, I'm not the person to ask. I, I don't watch it. Um, and I said to him, why? And he said, because I'll do some work on the day that feels good. And then it's not my property anymore. Mm. It will be edited, it will be cut up, and it will turn into something else. Not necessarily bad, but it will become something other than what I first offered. And then I will feel bad. So I'd much rather just live in, I did it on the day and it felt good, and then it's none of my business. That is a wise, wise man. And and I, I think that is the smart way to do it, I think, because I feel like mm-hmm. for me it's gone both ways where I felt – like something was good and then I saw it and I thought it was crap or mm-hmm. I felt that something was crap and then I saw it and I was like, oh, that's actually pretty good. And sure. so, yeah, I do think if you just kind of let it go, especially if you're auditioning and you're in the room, like there's no point in beating yourself up after you leave that room because it's done. And, and you know, as we both and all know, much easier said than done. Absolutely. To just let go and not care. It's, it's, it's a very easy mentality to yeah. talk about, but it's yeah. a much harder thing to put into practice. And, you know, something that I always used to try and do after auditions was like, I want to physically throw the sides in, in the trash can. Yeah. Like that, that's my marking, like done with that one. Yep. But that's just the symbol. Like I'm, I'm, there, <laughs> I'm still driving home going, mm, should have done that. That wasn't uh-huh. as good as it could be. And, it's, and that never goes away, I guess, huh? I don't think so. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's certainly not got anywhere close to going away for me, but. I, I guess maybe it's learning to tone it down and live with it, mm-hmm. take it for what it is, and that it's not reality, right? It's, it's, in fact, I think an acting teacher might have said that to me once, like that you're never going to shut down your inner critic, but you can quiet them and you can learn that you don't have to listen to them. And I, I, guess, I guess that's the skill because there's always going to be something in your head going, mm, was that enough? But it's about being able to ignore that and take a step back and just do the work anyway. For sure. So, okay, I love that idea of feeling not talented enough because I feel like that can be such a universal, broad thing that people can relate to, when, especially when it comes to work. Mm. And then in your personal life, do you feel anything similar to that or any other not enoughness as a child or, or as an adolescent or now? I don't think this gets spoken about a lot. So we watch a lot of, and I think it's something that's getting worse, so I think it's worth speaking about physically, right? So if you watch movies from even well maybe 20 years ago say or maybe even 15 right and because i think this is the thing that we speak about uh media representation of women's bodies a lot and obviously how uh damaging that can be to young girls and the whole thing of you know even the girl in the magazine doesn't look like the girl in the magazine the men in movies used to look like real people and then like superhero movies came out and and suddenly right there everybody was starting to look like marvel superheroes and now it's gone so far that even the normal people 
look like they could be Marvel superheroes, right? And seven, eight of those 10 people, they're probably having some chemical help to look like that, which I understand to some extent. Like, look, if you've got to play a god, you kind of need to look like <laughs> a god. Like, it's not an easy thing to do. Right. And then through social media as well, right? Like, you have these Instagram models oh, that yeah. have these incredible physiques and not many of them are very honest about how they achieve it. And then so you end up comparing yourself to it. And I'm somebody that has always struggled with not feeling big enough. Mm, like like muscular enough? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, manly enough. <laughs> I tread that line carefully as well, right? Because that's the other thing, isn't right. it? To, 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 to pair the two together mm. where muscles shouldn't be a representation of how manly you are, right? That, right. But, but again, through media and through things, that's, that's the kind of link that has always been made. Absolutely. I hadn't even thought of this aspect, but why do I want to feel more muscular? Probably because of that. So, so it kind of goes around in that Absolutely. ever damaging circle. Yeah, I've, I've always struggled with, like I was a very, very skinny kid. And then in my like need to, or desire to be bigger and stronger, then I got like, I was never like fat, but, but I started to put on unhealthy weight mm -hmm. um, because I just wanted to feel bigger. And, and now I'm kind of trying to find myself to a comfortable place. And, and, but it is, it's something that I've always got in the back of my head. Every, like my first fitting for 911, I remember putting on the uniform and being like, they're going to see me and they're going to be like, you don't look like a firefighter. <laughs> I, I thought I was going to get fired. I genuinely thought after my first fitting, I was going to get fired. Oh, I would look too so skinny in a costume. So maybe it is like the more like, because um, you talk about superheroes, you talk about muscles, you're talking about. So I know we don't want to say, I know, I know saying manly is uh, connotating a lot of other things, but it's maybe even just feeling not strong enough. In our society, there is an equation between you know, being strong, quote unquote, manly, muscly, big, and and what that means and, and what that represents. And boys are fed that from very young ages. I mean, the, everything you look at, every little superhero, every, you know, G.I. Joe and He-Man, and I'm aging myself by saying He-Man, but yeah, <laughs> all those kind of, you know, um, cartoons and, and, and what do they call for boys? They're not called doll, action figures. Mm -hmm. Is that what we oh, call yeah. them for boys? Yeah, action that, right? figures. Right? There's, there's the manly name for it. There's the, the macho name. And so that feeling of like not not living up to that to that ideal. Yeah, and and I actually think I'm somebody that I guess I'm quite lucky in a sense. I don't feel like gotta be manly. Mm -hmm. Like I've never shied away from emotions, which is something that we're when we're growing up maybe told to that aren't the most manly thing, right? And and actually. I think if we raised young boys better in that sense to be more in touch with their emotions, then we'd have much less of a need for such active feminism. Because I think that the problem is that you're being told that you shouldn't be emotional because that's feminine. Right. So you're making that out to be inferior. So I think that that's where a lot of toxic masculinity comes from. And then that is what causes the, the kind of uh, inequality. So I think if we raised young men and young boys better in the sense of like, it's okay to be in, and it, in fact, it's a great thing to be in touch with that side of yourself. I think the world would be a much safer place for women. So yeah, I've never really struggled with like needing to be a man, but I, I guess maybe I have in some subconscious level in the sense of, yeah, the physicality of it, because, because of always seeing these things in the media, seeing these in, in pop culture or whatever it is and, and, and feeling like, damn, why, my, why don't my arms look like that? Yeah. And then it moves into a whole nother thing where people will tell me like that I am of certain size and I'm, I'm six, two, I'm 200 pounds. Like I'm, yeah, you're not a small guy. You're like, but a, I feel it. But you because, feel small. Absolutely. Oh, interesting. I think most of us live in our high school bodies forever. Absolutely. Mm hmm. Me, me and my, my partner, we laugh about this all the time where we'll watch people on TV who are about our age. We're like, they look so old. They don't look our age. And then we're like, wait, do we look like that? <laughs> and we're like, we can't work out. We, we think that we still are 18 or whatever. And, and we don't notice the, the fact that we have also got older. I, I mean, I get your point. But I do think there is a thing, because I was talking about this recently, where in our heads... I, well, I also want to say I think big cities exempt from this because I think places like Los Angeles, maybe New York to some extent, Miami, Chicago, whatever, people in their 30s and 40s tend to look a lot younger than sometimes people in the middle of the country because mm -hmm. of the way we quote unquote 
take care of ourselves. I think. I think. Fair enough. I think we are just more a lot of times health conscious. You know, in LA, we're putting injectables in our faces. You know, everyone's doing something to make themselves look as young as possible,、sure. especially in this town. So while I get that, I think, I think your your point of like you that insecurity from being either in high school or junior high for me it was like junior high where I was like so painfully skinny,、mm-hmm. and I looked like. A sick kid, like, but I would eat so much, but I just,、mm-hmm. you know, and it's like, woe is me! Oh, you're, oh, you're too skinny. I know, right? Yeah, <laughs> and, yeah, 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 absolutely. When you're young, you have an insecurity, no matter, no matter what, whether you are the quote unquote perfect little child or not, you're always going to feel、mm-hmm. ugly. Yeah, it's part of growing up. Yeah, yeah, like uncomfortable, like you're not pretty enough, whatever the case may be. But I think that's so interesting because you are a, you are tall. You are, I don't want to say you're big, but you're like, you know, a good sized、sure. man. And, and and the other thing is like logically, I know that. Right, but in your head, you're like,、exactly. I'm still that skinny little kid. Exactly. Did you get like beat up or anything when you were younger? No, not really. <laughs> Did、um, you get picked on or picked on or? Nah, not not any more than any other kid. It, I just, I mean, I was small, and I, and I think I felt at the time maybe less capable because of it.、Mm-hmm. And as much as mentally I've grown out of that, I also haven't. Like, I mean, as I say, it's something that I still wrestle with. Like even to the point of nine one one, feeling like when I put on the uniform, like I don't look like a firefighter, like. See a real firefighter, and I'm like, that guy looks like he could pick me up and carry me out of a building. Do I look like that? Dude, does, does somebody going to trust me to run in there and drag them out? So, so it's, it's. What's the first word that pops in your head when you think that though? I'm not blank enough. What's the blank? Big. Big enough.、Uh, it's not a strength thing. It is literally aesthetics. Wow,、uh, that's so interesting. Or to be more specific, I guess muscular. Muscular enough, yeah. Because big could be any number of things, but 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 it is. I I I spend too much time when I'm working out, like looking at myself, like just why won't this bit grow? Or、uh, like like picking myself apart, and then going through this thing where again, sometimes then I watch myself on TV and、I'd、be like, oh, you don't look small. <laughs> That doesn't necessarily last. Does your partner have anything to say about this when you start questioning this?、Is、oh, she... she would think I'm being ridiculous. Okay, that's what I was gonna say. <laughs> yeah, no, she she would absolutely.、Um, which you know, again, one part of my brain also knows I'm being ridiculous, but but it's it's not always so easy to listen to the the sane, rational part, right? And and we're we're not logical creatures, really. We we are emotional things, and and going back to the manly thing is we should be emotional like that. That is how we're made. So yeah, it's, it's a thing that I struggle with constantly, and 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 I've, as I say, got myself into trouble where I've like pounding like you know fifteen hundred calorie shakes to try and put on more size, and then I just get like way out of control with that, and and you don't see it at first, you don't see it until like I just before I got nine one one when I was trying to bulk up and be bigger, <laughs> and I saw a video of myself recently, and I was like, no, why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you <laughs> tell me that I was looking like that? Right, because <laughs> it's just. Our own perception of ourselves is so often skewed, and then it's not until we look back, I think, that you realize what the world sees isn't necessarily what you see.、Mm-hmm. We all have like some, I think, some level of like body dysmorphia where we're just like, "What do I look like?" Yeah, and and especially possibly people in our you know chosen career field. Yeah, because it's a part of. Getting work,、mm-hmm. you know. Sometimes I think God, life would just be easier if I moved to some small town and owned a hardware store, and I didn't have to care about any of that anymore, because it, it is something that is embedded into what we do. And, and you know, it's fair enough. And when we know that we've signed up for that, that doesn't mean it's okay that it's such a big part of it. But it is going to be a part of it. Like that's just what it is. It's, it's something that comes part and parcel with it. Anything else that you want to want to touch on?、Uh, what else don't I feel enough? Okay, yeah. So, what else? Let me、doing? get the list out. <laughs> We got all day.、Um, this is really really good, and it's so interesting because, like I said, I wasn't sure how this was going to go、mm-hmm. because every other guest has had was able to check some kind of other box,、sure. and so I think that kind of makes it easier to talk about not feeling a certain enoughness because it's、mm-hmm. like we have some people don't feel black enough, they don't feel white enough, they don't feel、mm-hmm. light enough, sure, they don't sure, feel sure. man enough, but this just is like. Proof that like it really doesn't matter who you are or what you are. Everyone has these insecurities.、Mm-hmm. Everyone has some form of imposter syndrome. Everyone has the days where they feel like shit. I suck or I'm not blank enough. A guy I went to school with, and then later in my life, like so, when I was finished at school and, and I was doing okay, I think I was on Into the Badlands at the time. He said to me like, I just he, he's a young black man, and he said I just assume life has always been so easy for you, and like getting these jobs, and and you know, in some respects, I'm like. I mean, I guess it has been because I've not had any of the struggles that 
you would have to deal with coming into this industry or, or just in everyday life. I wouldn't call it easy for myself, but I understand, relatively speaking, mm -hmm. that it would look like that. I understand that. And that's okay that you, you said that as, and, and thank you for making me almost aware of the fact that to you, like, that there is that difference in that distinction. Yeah, absolutely. Again, that that may be a thing of being a white male, right? Because I'm an immigrant. But I'm not treated like I've come in from Mexico or Syria. But I'm an immigrant. I came here seeking work. Mm -hmm. I came here for more opportunity. But my immigration process was just a lot smoother because of the country that I come from. British actors and Australian actors. And I was so having because... with my American friends about hmm. Certain people like to complain about immigrants taking Americans' jobs. And usually the immigrants coming here taking these are taking the jobs that most Americans don't want in Absolutely. the first place. And that are the backbone of the economy as well. Ex like, you know, that, exactly. Yeah. And what we need. But then there are Brits and Australians who come here with no problem taking giant yeah. jobs away from American actors. <laughs> <No. laughs> Going back to that. Listen, and, and no one's going to complain about that. So it's just interesting what we like, what, what certain people like to complain about as far as immigrants go. I, I agree. And actually, I saw a friend of mine posting a couple of days ago. So um, there's a new Daniel Kaluuya movie coming out where he plays, I think, Fred Hampton. Mm -hmm. and, and the thing is like that he is a British actor playing this part. Right. And then my friend, black woman, she quite rightly said, I haven't seen any uproar about white British actors playing white Americans. Right. By the way, this also happened with Selma. Right, yeah. Um, uh, David um, Oluwayu. Playing uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Yeah. 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 Again, and, and so there's that fuss is made. But And in, even when um, Daniel was in Get Out, there was thing of like all oh, these black British actors coming over here playing black Americans. No one has ever said to me, you shouldn't be playing an American firefighter. Oh, that is such a good point. You're right. It only happens when they're black Brit yeah. Brits. So, so. Fucking A. It's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we can't win. Oh, it's God. just it, 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 yeah. So it, it's just that thing of right highlighting it mm -hmm. and being like, "Hey, look at this! How come it's one thing over here and another thing over there?" And, and trying to be conscious of it and, yeah. and speak up when it's going on. Thank you so much, Oliver. This was fantastic. It was great chatting with you. Thank you for having me. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Not Blank Enough. Please subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcast. And follow us on Instagram at Not Blank Enough Pod. Until next time, thank you for listening. Check the show notes for links and info about today's guest. This episode was produced during the COVID-19 pandemic of 2020 and recorded remotely. Our show today was produced by Gracie Mercedes and Dave Hill and edited by Douglas Sarine and Colleen Beasley. Not Blank Enough is a Gumption Pictures production.